Hey church, welcome to another online worship service here. Psalm 133 says, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it says, how good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity and praise the Lord. Let us dwell together in unity. Let us savor how good and pleasant it really is. Let's lift our voices and sing. Here we go. Treasure 
this gift of freedom gold can't buy. I bought the world and sold my heart. You traded heaven to have me again. My heart beating, my soul breathing. I found my life when I lay. We're so glad that you've joined us for another online service. Well, and as we are going into this Thanksgiving week, my prayer is that you will be able to set some time aside and really reflect on how good and faithful the Lord has been in your life, even through this kind of crazy season that we've been going through. God is still sitting on his throne. Well, speaking of Thanksgiving, we'd love to hear from you. If you wouldn't mind texting us 97,000 and just send us, what are you grateful for? What are you praising the Lord for this Thanksgiving? And we'd love to hear your prayer requests. So go ahead and send those in. And as a staff, we just love praying over you as a community. Well, this Sunday, actually, if you're watching this video today, Sunday, it is Newcomer's Lunch Day. So we want to invite you to come and join us at the well at ABF. And we're going to have an in-person lunch. This is for anybody who is new to our church, who's been checking us out for a while. We want to invite you to come and lunch with us. Our staff and our elders are going to be there. And we're going to just kind of have a roundtable conversation and let you know what ABF is all about. So we'd love to have you there at 12 noon. Um, coming up, we have a women's courtyard gathering, and that's going to be at 6.30 p.m. on December 7th. And you women, I heard you. I took in your, your suggestions. So we are having a worship Christmas sing-along. So put on those Christmas sweaters, bring your Christmas blankets. We're gonna be sitting in the courtyard. We're gonna sing our little hearts out. And this is just a great way, if you are new to ABF women, join us, get to know some new women, and jump into the Christmas spirit. 
Well, we also have a new men's Bible study that's starting up, and that's going to be from 8 to 9.30 a.m. on Tuesday mornings, and they're going to be studying the life of Christ. And so you are welcome to join in person on the campus or via Zoom, and you can get that Zoom link from john at agorabible.org. Well, hey, church, we are so proud of you. A huge thank you to everyone who participated in our blood drive and in our food drive. Man, our blood drive, we had over 35 people uh, donate blood, which actually means 111 lives are potentially saved by the blood that you donated. Awesome job, awesome job. And our Awana kids, they brought in over 700 units of food to bless our Caneo Valley. So. Thank you so much just for being a church that reaches out and wants to serve. Well, speaking of serving and generosity, man, we are so grateful here at ABF for your ongoing tithing and regular giving. We wouldn't be able to do any of the ministries here or around the world without your support. So you are welcome to give online or you can mail in a check or give online. Thank you so much for that. Well, hey, we have something super special today. Um, We want to invite up some friends of ours. We've got missionaries, Nate and Abby from Asia Pacific here. So come on up. Uh, These are our ABF missionaries, and they're here joining us now. They're visiting in town. So, hey, thanks for being with us. We love having you here. It's Always so much fun having you on campus. Well, we wanted to give our church just kind of an update of what's going on in your lives and what's going on in your ministry. And is there any ways that we as a church family can be praying for you? Yeah, well, um, we're glad to be back here, although our timing is unexpected. We weren't expecting to be back in the States this soon. Um, uh, One of the things you can pray for us is that our paperwork um, got held up and because of coronavirus, this office, uh, offices have been closed and haven't been able to get resolved. So we're looking, we're hoping to hear something soon, and uh, hopefully we can go back probably around January. Um, so that's something you can be praying for us. But in this last year, um, the ministry has gone gone well, and it's been pretty tough. Um, our uh, our missionaries that are interior and jungles have really relied on supply. That's been a big thing because. Uh, the small bush planes can't fly people in and out, but they can fly stuff. So we've been able to keep them going interior and keep their ministries alive. Um, and then we've uh, Abby's going to share with you some other. Yeah, because of coronavirus, it's really complicated a lot of aspects of our normal ministry. So some of that has been put on hold. But during this whole time, we've had some really severe medical evacuations coming out of the villages. So it was really cool to see how we were placed in the right spot to be able to help with some of these. One was a pregnant woman who almost died giving birth. So we were able to help her get out of the village during coronavirus and help her get to the hospital and do a lot of that. And there was some other ones, like some of the villages were warring and there were like arrow injuries. (laughs) And so just a lot of medical attention that needed help. So that was some big parts of ministry in our last year over there. Well, we are glad you are safe and we're glad that um, God has brought you home for this little season. And man, we're grateful to have you in the work that you've been doing overseas and just representing our church so well. Well, at this time, let's just take a moment to pray and uh, yeah, pray over Nate and Abby. Father God, we just thank you so much for what you are doing in and through Nate and Abby and just their hearts for missions, their hearts to reach out into this world where there's so many that don't know you and haven't heard of the saving relationship they can have with Jesus Christ. So I pray just, God, that you will bless them and the missionaries that are still um, working and uh, able to be there. And so, Lord, we ask for protection over them. We ask that you would guide them and use them. Right now, Lord, we pray for this paperwork. Man, we just pray for this paperwork to go through the appropriate offices and for them to be able to get their flights back and get back into the field. I know that's where their hearts and their passions are. So Lord, we just ask that you would go before them and we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. And Lord, as we're going into this Thanksgiving season, we have so much to be grateful for, your provision and how you look after us. And um, Lord, you've been just sustaining us. Even as a church, you've been sustaining us. And so Lord, I 
I pray over our church family as we're just going through this uh, Thanksgiving season, Lord. I pray that our eyes would look up to you. Sometimes when we look down, we can get discouraged, but when we look up, God, we see your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness, your provision in our lives. So Lord, help us to have eyes that look up. We love you and we just praise you for what you are doing in and through each one of us. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks, guys. Well, greetings, church. Uh, Good to be with you again online and a wonderful opportunity for us to continue to connect in God's word. And uh, I wanted to just mention, I I always appreciate just uh, different people that stay in communication with us during the week through emails, maybe a voice message, a text. Uh, This last week, I was really encouraged actually by a couple different emails, but one of them was from a a lady in our church uh, that sent an email just of uh, coming out of her quiet time and where she really sensed God prompting her uh, to send a note just to our, really, I think it went to our, our whole staff. Uh, just reminding us of the uh, potential uh, for division during this season and the importance of us fighting for unity. I was just thinking through it as I was reading that. I really took it as a a word from, from the Lord for us and a reminder for us as a church of how important that is during a season that's really uh, marked with so many different divisive issues. Like I can't think of any time in my entire life that there's been so many different hot topics on the table as a culture, as a country. I mean, if you think about it, whether it's topics of race, whether it's topics of law enforcement, politics, election results, and then you add into it COVID and all the crazy opinions uh, related to that, whether it's mask or no mask, vaccine, uh, six feet distancing, closed down, opened up, all the different things where opinions can cause, even within the body of Christ, division. I was thinking about us as a church and my heart and passion is to to see us resist that as best as we can. To really choose gracious dialogue, just talking about things just seasoned with grace, being okay with different viewpoints on some different topics that I'm going to suggest aren't going to really matter in eternity. Becoming listeners more than talkers making sure that we're elevating relationships over being right. All kinds of things, ways that we can be stretched on this. Most importantly, being quick to forgive when someone's said or done something foolish. All of this, I think, is going to protect the unity of the body of Christ. And also, as I was thinking about it, really the bond that we have in Jesus Christ supersedes all of what's going on currently. And so not allowing little things, little uh, wedges to be uh, forced into the church. And so a wonderful reminder from uh, someone within our church this week. And just a reminder, I felt like bringing before us as a congregation, as an opportunity to kind of get back to the making sure the main thing is the main thing. Well, as you can imagine, this idea of division, it wasn't true, isn't just true in our culture. It's been something that's been for generations, different sources of division over the years. In fact, during Jesus' season of time here on earth, his division was all over the place. It was marked with division, whether again, in, as it related to government, as it related to religion, as it related to race, there was division left and right. And probably the most prominent division that Jesus himself dealt with was him creating it. Him, the response to Jesus. There was division over who he was. Really, if you think about it, he was the hot topic of that day. Everything centered around who is this Jesus character and how does he relate to our lives? Is he, is he the Messiah? Is he a crazy lunatic? A lot of things circled around it. And so I believe we have some wonderful teaching here in our text as we deal with a people divided, a group of individuals that didn't quite know what to do with Jesus. I think there's a, a lot of lessons for us to learn. Let me just pray before we dive into the text here today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. And even with this charge 
uh, towards unity, I, I think of what you prayed for. The one thing that you cried out for out of anything for your church was for unity. My prayer is that we would take that call seriously and we would be intentional to resist anything that would create divide, even within this little body of Christ here in Old Agora, God, that we wouldn't follow the trend of the culture to break into different camps, but we would be quick to listen and slow to speak, God. Thank you for your call to unity and you also being the one that unifies the bond that we have through you. We thank you for that. Now we ask that you teach us through the study of your word, that you be active and present. You say that uh, you move through it, that you use it to cut to the morrow. And we invite that now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're starting in chapter seven here today. And uh, actually, if you see your notes and look down, you'll see that we're covering the entire chapter. And some of you are like, oh, great. What are we going to do with that? Basically, we're going to go through all of it, but we're not reading every single verse. I would love, I mean, it would do my heart such good if I found, if somebody sent me a text this week and said, I read all of chapter seven, that would really do my heart good. But we're not going to read through every single verse, but capture uh, the big ideas and theme all the way up until verse 37 and then hone in and be a little bit more specific on the verses moving from there. Basically, one of the reasons for that is as we look at the church calendar, I work hard with John to try to map, actually John ends up helping map this out a lot. We look at the calendar and looking at this building up towards Easter, we wanted to make sure that the resurrection, uh, the study of that landed on Easter where it wasn't uh, the account of his crucifixion on Easter Sunday. And so some of these sections we need to move through a little bit more quickly. So we're doing that a bit today, uh, but hopefully not missing any of the intent of the passage. Basically in the initial verses here, uh, John jumps in to uh, the next stage of his account of Jesus' life. And to be clear on this is the last account, the story that we we're going through last week, happened at the Passover, which occurs around April in the calendar year. This now is jumping ahead six months later to the Feast of Booths, which is in October. So basically, this is not an exhaustive account of Jesus's life, but really hitting on some of the key focal uh, points there. Basically, in the Jewish calendar, there's seven different festivals in the year. And this uh, would have been the last of seven. It's called the Feast of Booths or the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Basically, it's a reminder, really all of the festivals were a reminder of God's faithfulness and his provision in the life of Israel. It's interesting though, as they're taking time to reminisce and to celebrate God's provision, so many are unfortunately about to miss his greatest provision was himself coming down as a rescue. Basically what's happened, as we mentioned last week, as his popularity starts to wane, as his teaching starts to push people away, the tension starts to grow. And so Jesus is having to be a little bit more selective and which times he's going out in public and where he's going just for his own safety. It's interesting in the, these early verses, we get a, a picture of some family conversations where his brothers are trying to convince him that he should go to some of these areas that he hasn't been going because they would be important places for him to visit to expand his popularity. Basically, they're prodding him slash mocking him. Why don't you take your show on the road, head to the big cities, as if Jesus is having trouble figuring out how to promote himself. Basically, we're told, though, in the text that at this point, not even his brothers believed in him. You might not realize this, but Scripture talks about Jesus having four different brothers and two different sisters that are mentioned in Scripture, and we don't see them coming to embrace him as Lord and Savior until the other side of the resurrection you got to believe, though, if you had a sibling that claimed to be the Messiah, you would want to see them rise from the dead before you're willing to admit that. So either way, Jesus dismisses their fleshly agenda and kindly tells them, go ahead without me, head up to the feast because you're not hated like I am. At the feast, though, you see that people are very divided about his identity. Some thought he was a good man. 
Others believed he was a leading folks astray, so kind of a divided group, as I mentioned, even in our title here. But Jesus shows up at the feast, as he's consistent to make sure he goes to all of these feasts, shows up, and in the middle of the feast, so it's a seven-day long feast, Jesus gets up and teaches. Kind of an interesting feast when you look into it. Basically, they took seven days, and as I said, it was called the Feast of Booths. And what they would do is actually set up booths slash mini tents, and for seven days, they would stay in these booths as families in remembrance of God taking care and providing for them in the wilderness. It's kind of a, a, a camping trip of sorts. I don't know if you're like me. I'm not a big camper, but I enjoy it for little stretches. But here would have been a, a family time. So they're all in these different tents. And every single day, they would have a different feast during those seven days. In the middle of that feast, though, Jesus shows up. And we're told here in the text that he starts teaching to all the people. Can you imagine that? That was a pretty bold move when you have wanted posters all over the place with your picture on it. But instead, Jesus takes a risk. Verse 15, we see the people's response. The Jews, therefore, marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? But basically, they acknowledge that he's a, a great teacher and a great communicator, and somewhere he's taken in this degree of information to pass on, but that doesn't change the fact that they're not listening. They didn't really listen. They acknowledge that he's a great teacher, but aren't willing to listen and absorb what it is that he was teaching. Really, that's a scary place to become, and it's really where I'd suggest many in our country have gotten to as a, a place where they're no longer teachable. They're really just looking for things to confirm their biases or opinions instead of approaching things with a teachable mindset. That's where the people of Israel were at. They acknowledge he's a great teacher, but not willing to listen to what he has to say. Verse 19 and 20, he pushes the envelope with a pressing question. Why do you seek to kill me? And the crowd answered to him. Listen to their response. You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Two different statements there. First, accusing him of being demon-possessed. Are you kidding me? He's going around healing everyone and blessing, feeding people, providing for needs. Is that from a demon? Really? That's your conclusion? Then he, they ask him the question, who is seeking to kill you? Really? As if they don't know, they're the ones that are plotting to do that? But Jesus doesn't argue with them. He just recognizes the idea that these were different man-made expectations that they had that he wasn't fulfilling. They couldn't seem to get past that he was a Messiah or claiming to be Messiah, yet they knew his family. That was, seemed to be the one impasse. They couldn't get past that, and they, they kept on imposing that as if that was a stipulation that it be somebody that they didn't know in order to qualify as the Messiah. But that wasn't the case for all of them. Some people actually believed. Verse 31, yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? In other words, what more do you expect? We've seen him heal all of the sick. We've seen him provide for the poor. What more are you hoping for the Messiah to do? Reason had set in with some of them. But again, as I mentioned, a divided response. So the chief priests and religious leaders send in the armed guards or whatever the police would have been at that time to arrest him. Basically, imagine that leadership trying to capitalize on division so they're sent in to arrest Jesus. But Jesus continues to teach. He's explained to him, I'm just here a limited time. He's basically uh, explaining things to him as clearly as he can, but they don't seem to get it. What I had suggested is the same thing that I suggested last week, that during this stretch, he's laying seed for future harvest. At that point in time, and a lot of the things that he was explaining about being there a limited time, a short period of time, wouldn't have clicked until another six months later, all of a sudden they would start to connect the dots. And that's what I believe why in the book of Acts, there's so many people that respond to the gospel message after they've had a chance 
to piece it all together. That gets us up to the point where I wanted to draw our attention. Basically, at the end of the feast, at the end of the seven days, we have an interesting uh, uh, point of event. Basically, Jesus goes before the entire group of people and no longer tries to speak logic, no longer appeals to uh, conversations about uh, what expectations they have. He had been trying to point out inconsistencies between their faith system. Now he moves to just good old fashioned pleading for them to embrace him. Take a look with me. We'll start in verse 37. It says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I love this statement because you get the picture there of him crying out. The words actually there is a similar to the word or idea of yelling. So it's no longer just a, a calm rabbi sitting on a stool talking to everyone. Now it's escalated where he's standing up and shouting out to the people, come to me, any of you that are thirsty, an invitation that we're all so desperate to hear. We might not realize it. I was talking to my sister, Kathleen, who's a, a chaplain by occupation, and she always has interesting stories of interactions in the hospitals. And she was telling me a, an account of where she got the opportunity to present something that somebody was so thirsty for. She was telling me about a, a phone call that she got from the nurse's station at the hospital in the middle of the night. She'd get those occasionally where they had a 92-year-old patient that they couldn't seem to be able to calm down. The nurses that knew her and said, can you come in and just see what you can do? She shows up and, uh, and finds this lady in her, in her room and she's just rocking back and forth and in a real bad place, most likely in the last couple days of, of her life. And she keeps on repeating, keeps on saying, I have things to do. I have things to do. My sister goes in and tries to, tries to talk to her a little bit about this and kind of bring some reason to the situation. She's like, honey, you're, you're 92 years old. What things do you actually have to do? And she got her to respond. She said, good things. I have good things to do. She's like, well, well what, what good things? What do you mean by that? And it clicked in my sister's head that based on this woman's background, she spent her entire life trying to do enough good things to earn God's favor. And so she asked her this question. She said, are you saying enough good things so that when you stand before God, you've done enough good things? She's like, yes, yes, good things, good things to do. It's kind of a sad thought of this woman that's been paralyzed and crippled by that idea her entire life. My sister got to explain to her, and it's hard to say how much she embraced and understood, but the response was unexplainable other than she, it made sense. She explained to her, I have wonderful news for you. The good things that you're wanting to do have already been done. Jesus came as a rescue to quench your thirst, to meet your needs, to satisfy the demands of the law in a simplistic way. She explains it to her. Do you want to pray and embrace what Jesus did? And this woman nodded yes, and they prayed together. And all of a sudden where she had a, a tense, completely uptight and shaking and rocking back and forth, there was a peace that came over this woman because she took her up on the invitation to have her thirst quenched. Sometimes in the point of conversation with people, it's no longer about logic. It's no longer about reason. It just comes down to pleading with them to see you need your thirst quenched. You're desperate for you. You're desperate for that. I think it's interesting in that dialogue that Jesus is having. He uses the analogy of thirst, which common sense, you think like, well, that made lots of sense. They're in a pretty arid area. And the, usually the, the autumn season would have been the very most dry out of any of the seasons. But one other fascinating thing I was reading in my research is this, is part of the feast, it was really the most interesting part to me, part of the feast was each and every day, in memory of God's provision of water in the wilderness, 
the high priest drew water from a sacred pool and led a procession of people all the way back to the temple. And upon arriving back at the temple, two or actually three different trumpets were blasting, followed with the reciting of Isaiah 12, 3, which says, therefore, you'll joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. Therefore, you'll joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. This was the backdrop for Jesus standing up and saying, I'm the one that can quench your thirst. All of the things that promise to quench our thirst in this world that end up being false. Think about that, how many things that we go to that uh, appeal to that. And it's interesting that different people have different perceptions of what they think would be the one thing that would quench their thirst. If I had this, if I had this, if I did that, if I experienced this in the world and the enemy that we face has gotten really good at suggesting things that entice us. If I just had a, a, a better spouse or a spouse to start with, if I, if I just had a, a good small group or group of people that could encourage me, if I just had a job that aligned with my passions and used my gifts, if I just was part of a better church with a better preaching pastor, I don't know what it is that entices you, but the, you know, if I just had what Jesus offers to that, I am enough. He doesn't offer a lot. He doesn't offer all of meeting all of these different things. He says, I'm offering myself. If you come to me, I will quench your thirst. Look at the outcome that he suggests from the person that comes to him. Whoever believes in me, verse 38, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. We'll pause there for a moment. I made me think of this idea of providing or giving drink. When we were growing up, we had a silly thing. We didn't end up drinking a lot of pop at our house or soda. I don't know what word you call it, uh, Coke or whatever. Uh, but my dad was uh, always kind enough when he'd get a, a, a Pepsi or whatever. He always chose Pepsi, not Coke. Whenever he'd have a Pepsi, he would come to us, it was back when they had those big glass bottles. He'd come to us and he'd like, all right, what little birdies want to drink? And we would all line up as little kids and stick our heads, this is so weird, under the bottle and he'd pour like a little bit of drink inside of our mouths. And usually it was a mess, but it was so fun. Like I, I thought, man, someday, how awesome would that be when I become the dad and gets to pour drinks? And I think I tried it once or twice and it didn't really work very well. Very sticky, very messy, I found out. But this idea of going from the one taking in the drink to the one giving the drink. Kind of a cool picture. This is what Jesus is explaining. He says, this is how it works. I pour out drink to you and then you get to pour out drink to others. I offer what satisfies. He says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John 15, four says, abide in me and I in you. It's a powerful promise that he's gonna pour in so much of us if we allow him to. He explains in that clearly that that's the Holy Spirit he's referring to. He's gonna pour the spirit inside of us, those who embrace him, that embrace him as Lord and Savior, that it's gonna come out of us like an overflow. What a beautiful picture. Isn't that what you want for your life? Don't you wanna be known as a man? I'm just around him and there's just, it just overflows. It comes out of him or, or her. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus offers, not just to quench our thirst, but to become a thirst quencher ourselves. That's what's on the table. That's what he's inviting us to. Let's see at their response. It says, when they heard these words, some of the people says, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Again, stuck on that. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Imagine that. Some of them wanted to arrest him, 
but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who had said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered him, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But the crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who has gone before, has gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. We'll stop there for today. Basically, you notice in the text what it says. There was a division among the people over him. That's always how it works. People have different responses to Jesus. But unlike some of the crazy stuff we're arguing about as a culture present day, our response to Jesus actually matters. It has eternal significance. We see, though, that some people responded with basically a partial embrace. Do you see it there in the text? This really is the prophet or this is the Christ. But God, they, uh, the idea of him being a, a, a good man or a prophet and, and even some acknowledging him as the Messiah. But it's interesting, it's partial embrace. And you're like, why is that partial embrace? Because I'm wondering where were any of those people a couple months later when they're shouting, crucify him. When they're shouting, crucify him, There's, they're nowhere to be found. Basically, they're intrigued by Jesus and even acknowledge his identity, but never turn their life over to him. I've seen that so many times in the many years of ministry that we've been a part of. It's people that really warm up to the idea of Jesus, but as far as actually giving their life to him, uh, not so much. It's heartbreaking to watch people that were a part of different ministries I've been a part of over, over the years. And you see them just kind of drift and just kind of wander off. Did, did they believe in Jesus? They would have said so, but nothing was changed or marked in their life. Another group that you see in the text, I would suggest this group is those with unresolved questions. Well, look what they say. Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Basically, this is the group of people that are quick to point out obstacles to faith, but slow to do any work or research to get their questions answered. Basically, they, they love to point out uh, obstacles, but they don't do any of the homework. They won't do any of the research. Any one of them could have dug in and they would have discovered that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. There were plenty of witnesses to that. They would have discovered that he was from the lineage of David if they would have done any level of research. So many of us, our response is to critique, but then never put in the work to discover. So permanently stuck in this state of limbo. I would say some people stay in that state really all the way through, even until they're breathing their last breath. They leave their questions and their, their indecision finally becomes decision because at the point of death, wherever we are at is where we're at before God. Either we've chosen to embrace him or we've chosen to reject him. So you have partial embrace. You have un those with unresolved questions. Then you see those with just, Straight up, just complete rejection. Basically, this is the religious leaders, the majority of them, when they say, have you also been deceived? In other words, they're convinced that he's a, a liar, a, a lunatic, that all of this was completely made up. There's nothing you can do to convince that person. Doesn't matter what argument you make. It doesn't what, uh, what heart cry or plead you make. That person has settled in their mind and they've dug in their heels. Some of us cross paths with those people uh, regularly. What I love though is that doesn't mean that they're beyond reach. They're this complete rejection. And sometimes that person is the person that God loves to chase down the most. That's why it's important for us to never give up on somebody. God, no one's ever beyond the reach of the Savior. 
when I'm reading through this, these texts, it's kind of like you're, you're almost pulled into it and you're sensing, man, I wish I could jump into the pages of scripture and announce to him, guys, listen to what he's saying. He is the Messiah. He is your only rescue. Why are they so divided? But as I was thinking about this and trying to personalize it, if I'm real honest, I can be equally divided. Now, my divide is, isn't the same as, the, as theirs. It's not as if I'm divided about who Jesus is. What I'd suggest is for many of us within the church and the body of Christ are divided about what degree they wanna submit to him, what degree we wanna turn over to his leadership, what amount I wanna actually choose to follow, submit to his nudges. I was reminded of that even last night. I was playing uh, pickleball. You've heard me talk about that a bunch lately with a group of guys from the church. And we were in the middle of just a fun uh, set of games. And there's a guy that I noticed, and I really feel like the Holy Spirit was nudging me, that is just kind of standing on the, on the sidelines. He had his pad on hand waiting to play. We finished the game. And there was this kind of gap in, the, in between. And, uh, and I was like, oh man, I probably should just let him play, invite him. And there's this like inner tug of war. I'm like, but I'm having such a great time. It's gonna throw off our, our groove. And so it took a lot of work for me to say the simple words. Do you wanna take my spot? Oh, that was hard to say. But this I, I, idea of saying that and turning over, say, all right, go ahead in. And I felt like that's what the spirit was nudging me. That's what I'm talking about, divided. When you end up after a, a long, hard day, and we had this just last night, and one of the kids asked, can you come and help me with homework? Man, that's the last thing. And who did I direct to help with the homework last night? My wonderful wife was uh, there ready to go. But really, all of these are pictures and reminders of what level and what degree that we've entered in that we've chosen. When, when Jesus is saying, come to me, I will quench your thirst. It's with all of it. It's fully in. It's not a partial invite. It's saying, come allow me to be your everything. I was encouraged by the last group that you get little glimpses of belief starting to take root. Do you notice it there in the text? The first group that I love were the, were the policemen that were sent to arrest them. They come back and they're like, oh, uh, why didn't you bring back Jesus? And their, their response is like, I don't know. We've never heard somebody teach like them. I'm not gonna do it. You go do it. I, I love little glimpses where the seeds that Jesus was planting were starting to take root. What else in the text? Who else in the text do you guys notice? He's starting to take root. Who else? Come on, Josh, you gotta, that's right. Adrian beat you, Josh. And here, uh, he's competitive with that too. So here, here's the idea. Nicodemus, you remember him earlier in John had snuck in and remember my sermon called Nick at Night. He snuck in and found time to ask some of his deep questions. All of a sudden, who's defending Jesus in front of the group? Nicodemus is saying, we need to at least give a chance for this man to speak. We need to at least listen before we assume that he's guilty. Little seeds showing signs of belief. We don't know for sure what God did with the, the hearts of these, the, these folks, but either way, I love that we still, it's not, nothing's decided. Nothing's decided of how we'll embrace or reject Jesus. It comes down to free will where we choose, you choose. I'm not naive enough to think that somebody listening, even in this moment, hasn't at some point just been kept on pushing off, pushing off this decision. Man, I'll tell you what, there's never a better opportunity than the moment now to bend a knee, acknowledge, Jesus, I need you. I want to drink from your living water. I want you to satisfy the longings of my heart. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I've fallen short of your perfect standard and I embrace your death and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sin. That can be a prayer that you even have in this moment. We don't wanna be a people divided. We wanna be a people submitted. Let me pray as we wrap up. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this text and this other, another picture of your character. You're longing to see us restored and brought to you. 
Father, we thank you for this crying out that you do to the entire, all the people gathered at this feast. Come to me, those of you that thirst. I pray that during this season of crazy in our world and in our life, God, that we would consistently, not a one-time event, but consistently come to you to quench our thirst. God, we pray that we, I pray that that would be a routine, a pattern in our days and in our lives in the weeks and months to come of uncertainty, God. We thank you that you're a constant, that you're faithful, and you do provide for our thirst. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. And I just wanted to ask just for a, just a couple more minutes of your time just before we uh, sign off here today. 
If you've been around our church for any amount of time, any uh, different seasons, one of the routines that we have each year is we usually have some kind of a year-end project that we try to tackle as a church. And uh, last year, we were part of uh, building a church through Compassion International. We were part of thank God, doing a season of building some reserves up for our church and other little projects. And so it was kind of a, a neat time each year to tackle some different things uh, with year-end giving. Well, this year is a, a little bit different because one of the le- reasons we leave margin at the end of the year uh, for that is in case there's a year, kind of like this year, where you're hit by some different surprises financially. And I can't think of any year in my life that we've been hit more with surprises as a church or as a ministry. And so The first thing as far as year-end projects, and I'm gonna just mention three that we're trying to tackle. The first thing is for us to do a little bit of catch-up on our budget for 2020. If those of you that uh, see updates on that on the bulletin or a weekly email, we're about $60,000 behind. And uh, we have some catching up to do on this year's budget in order uh, to kind of close the year out uh, appropriately. So that's the, the first thing that we're trying to tackle as a church. And the second thing is we've been just made aware as we interact and we had a couple different things this year. We're trying to help out financially with some of our missionaries and some of the different needs. And so it was kind of cool this past month, uh, our, our missions board sent out some notes to our different missionaries just to check in what some of their financial needs and what they would be able to do uh, with an extra thousand dollars in the month of December. And uh, it was fun to, to hear back some of, uh, from some of them of things that they'd like to, to tackle. One of them, I'll, I'll just read a couple of them. We're trying to raise our second projects to raise $10,000 uh, for helping out some of our missionaries with specific needs. Uh, one of them mentioned it would go towards uh, meeting needs of kids in the anti-trafficking ministry in Cape Town. You're like, well, that's a noble cause. Uh, another was winter clothes and firewood and Christmas outreaches in Moldova that they have planned. Another was uh, food in response to the, uh, to the COVID shutdown in a Syrian refugee camp where we have ministry happening there. Uh, for Nate and Abby, it was kind of interesting just hearing with them. We were just talking about it before uh, we started here with this video. One of the things specific is just they're surrounded with families, even in their own community where they minister, that man, when sh- there's the shutdown of COVID, when you don't work, there's no social program to meet needs. And so they're excited to potentially even use that to bless people they specifically know in their community. Missionaries, another missionary talked about needing training materials for uh, guests for a, a pastor's conference they're doing, relocation expenses for another missionary, uh, bringing a few pastors here from Moldova for the Shepherds Conference, a, pro, a program for a boy's home in Ethiopia with some of our missionaries there. Uh, one of them was doing a, a project during this stretch where they're trying to provide eyeglasses for those in need. So they thought that it could be utilized for that. It's just kind of fun to see all the specific needs, uh, even just connected and linked to our church through our different missionaries. And so that's our second project. One is catching up uh, with year-end budget. Two is raising the $10,000 to try to bless some of our missionaries. And then three is something that we've been in a rotation of of doing is one year we'll do something more outreach focused and the next year we'll do something more campus related. And uh, my elder board has kind of laughed because a a number of, for a number of years I've talked about, man, I just want to see this church become more and more of a community center. And you walk through here any given day or evening of the week, and we've got different programs from different outside groups coming all the time, whether it's a basketball program, whether it's the Eagle Scouts, whether uh, just a a karate group that's been here, a number of different groups that we're trying to be a blessing, be an epicenter in our community. So I've wanted for a number of years to put in a playground right outside where that weird gaga pit that you've probably seen is, uh, something that would be a long lasting uh, kind of thing for uh, families and kids to be blessed in, in the idea of this being a, a community center slash, slash outreach center. And, uh, and so anyway, that I obviously know that we won't necessarily be able to tackle this year because that's a pretty big fund. And so we thought in addition to uh, hitting this year's budget, missionary stuff, we'd start the savings process for that. And with that, the money that any money that would go towards that, 
We wouldn't do anything in the year 2021 until we see that we're kind of in the clear. Obviously, there's a lot of unknowns in the year ahead. So we're going to wait till the end of next year, hopefully add to that pot and be able to finish the park in 20 uh, playground in 2022. So those are our different plans as we're talking through the end of the year and just excited to see how God's going to move my one ask is that you would allow this to be a spiritual exercise. I always say that any fundraising that we do is for us to just seek the Lord and just go before him, ask him what it is that he'd like to nudge you towards giving. And if it's something that he wants you to do, that he nudges you towards, give. And if you don't sense that nudge, and most pastors won't say this, but I'm going to, don't give. Basically, it's a, a spiritual exercise for you to go before the Lord. So we're excited to see how God's going to work and use that uh, ministry effort here at the remainder of the year. Thanks so much for taking a couple extra minutes with, it, with, you, with us. God bless you. Have an amazing week ahead.